I did. We did move the speakers and turned them up. There we go. We just have to make sure we're still speaking loudly. Make sure what? We're speaking loudly because the you can't turn those things off. Um, I hear it. two candidates for the open seat on March 31st, and we have approved Mrs. Diana Rodriguez for the position on the board. So at this time, I will administer the oath of office. So Mrs. Rodriguez, would you please stand and prepare to receive the oath? All right. Repeat after me. I do solemnly swear that I will support. I do solemnly swear that I will support. Obey and defend the Constitution of the United States. Obey and defend the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of this Commonwealth. And the Constitution of this Commonwealth. And that I will discharge the duties of my office with fidelity. And I will dis discharge the, duties, the of duties of my office with fidelity. With fidelity. Thank you, Mrs. Rodriguez. Thank you. Happy to have you. Thank you. And it will be like drinking water from a fire hose. <laughs> okay. Dr. Z, do we have any comments tonight from Superintendent? I do, Madam President. One change that the board may have noticed from the Friday update, we flip-flopped item J and K so that we can have Phyllis cover all of her respective items all at once. Um, we've also, also made item J, approval of forecast five agreement, an action item, rather than an item to go on next week's consent agenda. Um, we need to get that um, signed, sealed, and delivered so we can put it into action sooner than later. Um, I do have two items regarding end of year activities. Pennsylvania school code requires 990 hours and 180 days of instruction. And if the district provides the number of hours, it's allowed to have an act 80 day. And that's a day where teachers come in and work on curriculum and instruction activities and students do not need to be in attendance. Over this past school year, to include the next 38 school days, 38, <laughs> uh, we will have accumulated the necessary mandated instructional hours. That all being said, Friday, June 4th, will be the last day for students. Again, Friday, June 4th will be the last day for students. And Monday, June 7th, <clears throat> will be an Act 80 day for teachers only. Speaking of June 4th, my birthday, that is the day originally scheduled for graduation. Um, I'm meeting with Dr. Smith and members of his leadership, student leadership team tomorrow to discuss options for the graduation ceremony. He will be sending out a survey to the class of 2021 to choose from the limited options due to the ongoing COVID restrictions that we are facing. I will have an update for the board and the community at next week's meeting. And I'd like to take this opportunity to once again offer my sincere appreciation to the way our students, faculty, and staff are continuing to do what they can to mitigate the spread of the virus. Ongoing mask wearing and hand washing, social distancing and contact tracing 
continues to result in our positivity rate being consistently lower than that of the county. Also, with large number of faculty and staff having already received their vaccination, and with the county now opening up vaccination appointments for those 16 years of age and older, should they choose to get vaccinated, we are one step closer to the end of this pandemic. That's all for tonight, Madam President. All right, thank you. Are there any board comments tonight? Are there any public comments? We actually have some public. Okay, and then let's move right along. We have the finance update. That Donna and Tim. Scott Kramer. Scott. I'm not going to knock the microphone over to me. <laughs> Stay away. It's going to be close enough so we can hear you, sir. Just close enough so I can hear you. So I'm going to just tee it up real quick. Uh, with us this evening is uh, the folks from your bond council. Uh, when we were here last, we talked about coming back this, this month with a resolution um, authorizing the issuance of the non commuted debt that we need and also the action that you need to take for the termination of the swap. Um, and so with that, we've been working with Adele and Phyllis in updating the information for the rating agency presentation. We expect uh, that we'll have the rating back in, in our hands probably within the next three to four weeks. Um, so we're hoping to lock in rates as soon as the early part of May on that next 40 million. Um, we'll be continuing to be in touch with you all about the next phase of the projects as I know you're working with um, the architects on um, finalizing those other projects down the road. Um, so we'll be in touch, um, but everything seems to be moving um, as expected. So with that, I'll turn it over to uh, the folks from McNeese Wallace. Good evening. Uh, thank you, Scott. Let me just get a little closer here, so make sure the folks are going from here. Uh, good evening, members of the board and uh, administration and staff. My name is Tim Horseman. I'm an attorney with McNeese Wallace and Newark, uh, your bond counsel. And we prepared a resolution for consideration by the board this evening. Um, if you're familiar with bond resolutions, you'll notice that this resolution is a lot thinner. Only well, they were all this thin. Uh, this resolution authorizes uh, two things. One, it authorizes the board to terminate uh, the interest rate swap that was previously entered into back in uh, 2018. Uh, and then also authorizes the issuance of a series of bonds to finance the resulting termination payment that will be associated with that swap termination. Uh, these bonds would be non Laguna bonds. What that means is these, these are bonds that are not backed by the district's full faith credit and taxing power. The bonds would just be backed by uh, a pledge to, uh, to appropriate in each year uh, revenue sufficient to pay the debt service. There'd be no ongoing obligations, so these would not be considered debt for state law purposes. Uh, beyond that, um, again, that's a very brief overview of a very brief resolution. But if there are any questions from the board, I'm happy to take those at this time. And this will be on the set agenda next week. That's correct. With the resolution that's presented. Any questions? Okay. We like that. No questions. All right. Good. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next, we have Wes. Change orders for middle school. Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Any order you want these in? Um, I was going to start with site, Dr. Z. But, or you want to do yours? Might be easier. Mine's pretty simple. Mine's yes. uh, CO number one, ATER. ATER? You got ATER. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Good evening. 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 This is a no cost change order. So when we were going through the specifications, we realized that. The, the items specified for additional equipment for us to maintain the turf fields are actually pieces we already have. So in talking to our rep with a turf, he uh, suggested we we swap that out for a different piece of equipment that allows us to collect debris and it has a magnet behind it that you'd be amazed what we find in the turf field. Mm -hmm. So actually ours is getting cleaned, our stadium's getting cleaned tomorrow, so they will literally have a couple trash bags filled with uh, cleats, earrings, uh, necklaces, bobby pins, uh, you name it. Um, yep. So it, it's just 
amazing what comes out of that. So it's it's why we get it clean. We get it tested every year, but this will allow us to do some of that that uh, intermediate clean. So it's a no cost change order. So it's pretty simple that way. So. Okay. So it's site west. Yeah, I was gonna start saying that. So as an overall summary, uh, as I'm sure you folks have realized, there's quite a few tonight, um, but the net result of all of these together is an out of $1,100. Um, and then I'll break down where this is all coming from. The site, we have four change orders we're looking at this evening. Um, we did discover a previously unknown hose bib uh, near the grass fields, slightly north of the grass fields. Uh, we need to, Ken doesn't need it for anything, so we're just going to cut and cap it. Uh, PCO 12, and as I go through these, obviously, please interrupt me with questions. Let me know. Um, we're building a small site wall between the existing stadium and the future turf fields. Um, we looked at that foundation associated with the fencing and the wall and uh, found a better way to do it, a more efficient way. Um, less concrete, and that's what that credit is reflecting. And then we have two sinkholes we needed to address uh, over the previous month. Um, PCO 13 for $33,379, and then BCO 14 for $9,068. Um, and those make up the civil change orders. And then Plumbing, Dr. Plumbing's not on my list, but you know. I'm sorry, which one? Plumbing's fine, yeah. Plumbing. The one you're about to put, yep. Yeah. Wes, can I ask a quick question? Yes, absolutely. I was just curious, just because I don't know much about sinkholes, but I, you know, the costs are vastly different. Is that based on the size and the location, or what is the size is the main driver? So, how we've remediated these so far is they put in what's called foldable fill. And if you look at the breakdown, um, that's what's causing that number to jump up. We, We've kept most of them in that, I'll say, two to four thousand dollar range. Unfortunately, this one just it needed a lot more flowable film. So we have uh, Mike Cast, who is the on-site construction manager, ma monitors the hours, and materials spent, and uh, against what horse is submitting to make sure we're uh, getting a fair rate. And we agreed upon all this prior to uh, construction starting. Thank you. No problem. Okay, I think Dr. Z is pulling up plumbing. So plumbing, we have six change orders. Um, the first one is a credit. Um, there was a slight duplication in scope between the site contractor and plumbing contractor for bringing water to the future set, shed site. Um, I think we'll see some additional credits for that in the future, which I can explain when we get those in front of you. But for now, that is uh, representative of the plumbing scope. PCO4R is to provide additional piping required for a roof train over the mechanical room. PCO5 is to add the gas regulating valve for the gas service to the labs and the pods. PCO6 is a coordination item between the food service contract and the plumber, requiring, as you as noted, a four inch underground cast iron drain. And then the last, or PCO7, is to add a T and isolation valve. This was done in conjunction with Ken and allows a better, allows the system to be drained down from that point. And then PCO8 uh, is a roof drain coordination item for roof drains located over the stair, or as we noted here in quarter A200. And then finally, we have general contracts change orders. I have not presented any for the general contract yet, so this is GC01. And then, yep, Dr. Z's got it up. All right, change order one is a uh, reduction in the projection screen scope. As some of you know from Brownstown, the district is moving toward fixed screens on the wall or screens on carts, but they're moving away from the projection system. So this represents the elimination. That was done 
Joshua, Kim, feel free to chime in, but that's been done kind of as this project was going to bid, so that scope was still in there. And that, uh, there was a credit of approximately $8,600 associated with that. CO4 is a uh, blank off panel, one of the windows to achieve a better seal for one of the operable partitions in the music rooms. And then CO05R, um, per coordination with the new building principal, we eliminated the in-school suspension room between the principal office and the assistant principal office. With that elimination comes an elimination of a door, the associated glazing that was to be used to um, keep eyes on that room, and uh, obviously the wall creating the room. And then finally, um, change order seven for credit of $13,780. It's a reduction in lab casework. And I want to be sure to note here, that was done in conjunction with the faculty. For those of you who know Dr. Danikery and his team, they have very specific items they want in there. And we had worked throughout design, and then when we got the submittal, we went back to them and fine-tuned a few things, and it's uh, they actually wanted a little bit less, and that's uh, the result of it. So as I said at the top of my presentation, um, all that nets out to an 1100 ad. It didn't move the needle on the overall change order value. We're still at, or change order percentage, I should say. We're still at negative 0.17%, which is the same as we saw last month. Could you tell me if when you got rid of the room, where did the space go? It's being added to the principal office. So, okay. And I obviously don't understand all of the plumbing. But are these all things that um, couldn't be foreseen, that, or are they things that should have been put in there, these valves and such? The gas regulating valve was an emission on the plumbing documents. Um, which, which one is that? That's PCO5. Um, I mean, PCO3 is just elimination of scope. PCO4R uh, is also an emission. They missed the roof drain that is on my drawings. So one of the reasons it's revised is we went back to the plumber and said, you should have the roof drain because it's on my drawings, but associated plumbing is not shown on the plumbing drawings. So that's what that amount is for. And who does those drawings? That has all been engineering. Um, I mentioned PCO5, PCO6, I would say is a coordination item between the food service drawings and the, the plumbing drawings. Um, who was to provide what and it got a little crossed up, I would say. PCO7 was an owner request, so that was not an omission on the documents. Um, as I think I mentioned, they'll allow Ken to better uh, provide better maintenance for the system, and we think it's a good value for the school district moving forward. And then finally, PCO8, I would also categorize as an admission on the plumbing documents. That, I will note, we are going to have a forthcoming credit. There is some revisions to the roofing that will work to offset the, this number. I would have liked to present both, but some of these plumbing ones have been outstanding for a bit. Um, so I wanted, to get you, I wanted to get them in front of you. But when I present that, I'll, I'll tie that back. We don't forget about one. Thank you. For consent. All of those on consent next week, then? Any other questions? Thank you, everyone. Next, we have Mark Kurowski. Um, back to K&W. You did. Thank you. Way better than most people did. Good evening, folks. Mark Kurowski with K&W. Um, you may recall we're the site civil engineers on the middle school project. Here tonight to talk about uh, some traffic 
uh, improvements and work associated with that project. Uh, you may recall from during the middle school design and permitting, uh, there was a lot of conversation with both the township and with PennDOT about required improvements both on Horseshoe Road and Mount Sydney Road. Um, we went through a very lengthy traffic impact study review process, again, initiated first with the township and then subsequently through PennDOT. That, project, or that process just came to resolution about a month to a month and a half ago where we finally had everything addressed by the town or for the township's comments and for PennDOT. That's the first part of the process for traffic. Once that study is done, it allows us to define, okay, now here's the work that's required to design the improvements, get those improvements permitted through PennDOT, uh, and then actually take those through bidding and construction. So the request that's in front of you for discussion this evening quantifies all of that effort from essentially, I'll group it into three categories. Item A looks backwards a little bit and says there was some work that was required as part of the traffic impact study, both for the township and PennDOT. That was beyond our scope of work. There was additional effort that we had to undertake. Okay. Items B through I believe H are the permitting and approvals. That is, Again, mostly PennDOT, the township will be part of this process because the work that we're doing on Horseshoe and Mount Sydney is going to impact the stormwater management that's on the high school or the middle school high school campus, as well as if you're familiar, the ENS and NPDS permit, which basically is the permit that's associated with earth moving. Those are both impacted by those improvements. We have to revisit those as part of this project. We don't expect that we're going to be rebuilding the basins all across campus. It's just they're so complex and they connect with each other. We have to look at them all again as part of this effort. I would also note that, again, through those items B through H, that includes a highway occupancy permit, which is PennDOT's process for the actual physical road improvements. That's showing the turning lanes and the road widening and all the pavement markings, um, handles the, the drainage calculations. That's all part of the HOP work, short, short language for the highway occupancy. Along with that are the right-of-way plans. Because we actually have to widen the road, that requires the dedication of some right-of-way to PennDOT. That, would, that process is included there as well. Um, and missing under those items. Um, that also includes traffic signal design and um, permit. So at the intersection of Mount Sydney and Horseshoe, we have some road improvements, but we also have to do some improvements to the traffic signal itself. In terms of timing, because we're widening the road on Mount Sydney as you head northbound into that intersection, we have to do some work on the signal there as well. And the kind of the third component is once we get all the way through those approvals, we then have to take that process through its own bidding period, construction period, and then post construction, there's some documentation that we need to do to close out all of that work upon completion. So it's a it's it's essentially a project unto itself. You may recall we were able to work with the township um, to allow the construction obviously for the middle school to proceed while this was happening on a parallel path where kind of the the end point was we just need to have all of this work designed permitted and constructed then in conjunction with the conversion of the old middle i'm sorry old elementary old middle to elementary so this tracks just fine for that. You know, we do want to, you know, that's why we're here tonight. We had to wait for the traffic impact study to be approved so we could say, okay, here's what the work is. Now we're ready to go. And that gets us geared up for, ultimately we're targeting the permitting to be secured by, uh, I believe early 2022 with the intent to bid that work, probably early 22 for some, for um, summer construction in 2022. There's a lot in here. I know there's a lot of technical jargon. Please, uh, any questions you have, I'm happy to, to speak to any of them. Could, could you tell me um, how this how this costs out? <coughs> uh, sure. So if you look at, I believe it's probably page six. Um, should give like a, almost like a menu uh, line item of price for each of those items. There you go. That actually breaks down um, the cost for each one of those components. Yeah, I, I have that added up. Uh, what was our estimate going into this project that uh, road improvement might cost? So we, we actually did not prepare one at that point because it was kind of fluid as to what the improvements were going to be. One of the first components in this effort is to 
prepare an estimate based on the conceptual drawings that we did for the traffic study. It will have some assumptions because there's some stuff we won't know until we actually get into the design component. But we'll work up that estimate. That's one of the first tasks under the scope of service. So we had no idea what the possible uh, request might be? As far as the cost of the construction? No, just as far as what they might end up asking us to do. Uh, Didn't no, we, we know that there was a chance they would ask us to widen that road? Oh, yeah, I mean, that was established early with the traffic impact study, correct. Okay, so couldn't we have come up with some sort of estimate knowing what road widening costs? Uh, we could have done something very approximate from conceptual drawings, but it would have been just that, very conceptual, and still would be, to be honest, at this point, because the detailed design is when that, those in, that piece of information gets fleshed out. I was just wondering why we couldn't have had at least a ballpark figure. You know, like if we have to widen this, we know it's going to cost, you know, in the area of you know, 200 to 300,000, something like that. That's certainly information I can bring back to the board in fairly short order. Um, again, we, there's two there's two pieces. We'll do a conceptual estimate based on just the conceptual uh, design that we have, which again is just kind of looking in two dimensions. That'll incorporate things like we know we're going to have to move some utility poles. Um, it's going to have to make some assumptions on the stormwater piece because we just won't have that design yet. But we can do it to be able to say, okay, here's where we think we are today. And then subsequently, when we get through the first round of detailed design, then we can do a detailed estimate that says, okay, now we've got good definitive quantities and numbers that we can price from. I'm referring to a ballpark figure at the front end of the project, yes. knowing that we're going to have to do something mm -hmm. and having some idea what that might be and your expertise in knowing what those things cost, mm -hmm. you know, generally, uh, it would have been nice to have that figure at that point, too. Okay. So there's nothing in our construction budget for this. If that I do not know the answer to. I don't, I don't know. I'll take a look at the budget for the construction budget. I'd like to see where we are compared to where we thought we were going to be on this. We'll get that information for you. Thank you. Is there action requested on this document? Probably consent first. No other questions? Okay, okay. thank you very much. Okay, next we have policy review. Who's first? We're going to go with 814 first. 814? 814, yes. 814 first. Good evening. This is Rodriguez. Welcome. Congratulations. Um, my name is Don Mann. I'm the assistant the superintendent for secondary ed. Looking forward to working with you. Okay, so policy 814 deals with um, hybrid materials. In this particular policy, I was hoping to have less changes than Phyllis, but it appears she has less than I do. <laughs> <laughs> See that? <laughs> we got far. Um, two minor changes. Adding to the to the, the beginning there under under policy, the notion of penalty of unauthorized. So that, that's that first piece there. Um, no changes in, in the center part of the policy. And then at the end, adding um, clarification on and around guidelines, you know, referring to the guidelines that set up that, that uh, staff need to follow in, in regard to um, copyright regulations and so forth. So the rest of it, based on our review of the other uh, work from PSBA is right on. I would just like to say this is a good thing. Copyright law has teeth. <laughs> it can be expensive if you violate it. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's where the with the regulations going in there and making sure that all that's detailed and yep. Thank you.
This is great. My changes are never shorter than Dr. Vance. Ever. <laughs> awesome. And Mrs. Rodriguez, welcome. I'm Phyllis Heverly Flesher. I'm the Chief Finance and Operations Officer here. So um, you'll be sick of me by the end of tonight. So just hang, hang, hang tight with me. All right, uh, first thing I have is policy 812. Um, so some pretty minor uh, changes to that policy. Uh, really the big thing that we were trying to capture from the PSBA models that we looked at was that the coverage um, covers the actual or replacement cost. Um, so we did add that piece. Um, one change that we could make to this policy that we just didn't recommend, but if you want, um, we can follow this. Um, the PSBA language does not list all these individual policies. So you'll see, um, because we have a couple of coverages that were not mentioned here, we added them. Um, but the PSBA language just basically has a very generic statement and does not list them. Um, we chose to add the ones that we had because our list was there. Uh, so it made sense to us that at some point in the past, the board decided that they wanted to see that. Um, but certainly if you're more comfortable with the generic and sort of, you know, not knowing, um, you know, we can take that out and just put the generic statement in as well. So you can sort of think about that and let us know what you think. But that's it for um, the policy tonight. Well, this doesn't mean we couldn't take out insurance other than all this. This just should you add or as necessary. I'm sorry, I didn't quite. This, this list, okay, uh, covers what we should, what insurance we should be providing. Yeah, and the PSBA but model it's not, just. But it's not limited to just those. Correct, but the PSBA model just very broadly says the board has the authority and responsibility to provide adequate insurance coverage to protect the district interests in buildings and properties, period. Doesn't mention any of the specifics. So that would be the option if we wanted to follow the PSBA. No, I, what I'm just saying is perhaps it should, just should mention that any other that we decide is necessary. Oh, others as necessary? Yeah, yeah sure, yeah. you can include that. Mm -hmm. Make sure you let that open at the other end. Sure. That's all. Now I'm with you, sorry about that. Yeah, that's okay. Could you, do we have all of the ones that are listed here? Yes, that's why we added the other two okay. because the two were two that we have that were not listed. Okay. Could you just very quickly tell me what kind of cyber coverage we have, what sort of things that covers? <laughs> oh boy. Um, so generically, it is for if we were ever attacked um, meaning we either um, had somebody who infiltrated the system mm -hmm. or uh, put our system in lockdown and requested ransom from us That's for that. The, the specifics of the coverage I can certainly get for you, but I'm no, not going to promise you that, that I can specific. rattle them off the top of my head tonight. I but that's essentially specific. what it's for. Okay, it's your ransom, generally. Or, or and cost of repair and cost and any of damage. recovery, yes. Okay, thank you. Sure. Any other questions? So are you going to stay up there and do uh, yes, ma'am? Budget reductions. Yeah, that's why I conned Dr. Mann into going first. I thought I'd <laughs> just roll through these then. Um, so I will do number two, obviously, which is the uh, the budget reductions, and then I'll I'll go over to uh, my seat and let uh, Sarah and Adele take over. Uh, so, Dr. C, if you want to pull up the, yep, that's the one. So this is, um, again, a fairly short presentation for you tonight. Um, my intent was really just to show you where we are. So, um, again, since um, Mrs. Rodriguez is new, uh, just to kind of talk about where we are in the budget cycle, um, we, uh, the board approved a preliminary budget in February. February is also the time where we internally go through the budget department by department, building by building, and try to see what is really needed and what reductions can we um, can we achieve. Um, so Dr. Z, if you would go, I think, yeah, slide one is just showing um, the index um, and the way the calculation works. So you've seen that one before. Um, the next slide should be uh, where we left off in February. So what we were looking at was an official preliminary budget. And again, remember that revenue number had the Act 1 index and the exceptions in it. So 
Um, when we get to where we are now, if the deficit looks a little odd to you, it's because I've, I've taken those number, taken that amount out. And then the next slide um, should show you a summary of the revenue changes. So uh, we are not seeing uh, the depression of the earned income tax. I think I've mentioned that to you before that we were expecting this year. Uh, we do believe that part of that is because the jobs that have been lost are lower paying jobs. Uh, so the, um, the higher paying jobs are, are still, um, are not in the unemployment numbers. You know, folks are still employed in those jobs, so it's still generating um, a healthy earned income tax. We're not seeing an, a nice increase in our earned income tax, but we are not seeing the decrease that we had projected. Uh, real estate transfer, and we had a couple of properties that changed over, so that number is actually going to be a little bit higher this year um, than, um, than we were anticipating, so we made an adjustment um, for next year as well. Uh, and then um, on the staffing side, that is a negative because what happens is when we put um, staffing decreases in on the expense side, uh, what happens on the revenue side is what the state gives us in subsidy for the portion that they cover of um, PEASERS of the retirement system and Social Security. So we have to sort of net those numbers out. Uh, so you'll see that um, overall revenue changes of about half a million dollars. And then if we go to the next slide, you'll see the expense changes. And I did them by category. Um, certainly, if you look, I did attach the five, the standard five-year projection spreadsheet that we use multiple times throughout the year to the presentation as well. Uh, so if you have trouble kind of figuring out where these things go, I just call me. We're glad to walk you through it. Um, but I, for if I were sitting in your shoes, for me, it's easier to see the category of what it is than to call it a purchase service or a property service. Um, I think this just is a little more intuitive um, when you see these descriptions. Uh, so you can see uh, this is the result of that effort that we did internally in February. Um, so saved about a uh, million dollars there. Um, if you looked at this slide at some point over the weekend, I did have the, there was $10,000 for grants and I had it coupled in with the safety line item, but it's really related to um, some pupil services items um, that we're anticipating will be funded by the ESSER funds. So I moved it. So that was the only change to, uh, to that slide. And then the next slide then shows the end result. So where we had anticipated and what I did was I took that February preliminary budget and I reversed the Act 1 and the exceptions out of it. So you could see what it would look like if we did not do a tax increase. So it grows that deficit number. Um, so with that as our new placeholder, then comparing that to where we are now, uh, so we still have work to do, obviously, right? It's only April, but where we are now um, shows about a $3 million deficit. So obviously we are getting um, a sizable chunk of ESSER funds. And so our work with you over the next 30 days or so will be to show you how we believe um, the best use of those funds will be. Get your feedback um, so that you know you can talk to folks about it, get their feedback. Um, we've sort of done our internal process. Um, we've had a couple of meetings already where we've been talking in, in buildings and departments um, about appropriate uses for those funds and, and certainly be sharing, with, sharing that information with you. Um, so, as we move into the proposed final budget in May and then asking you for an approval in June, what you should anticipate is that there will be, some of that money will be added on the revenue side and then the expenses will show up on the expense side as well. Um, there are also some funds that we've identified that are already in the budget that we can use some of those funds to offset. So it will make some reduction to that $3 million we're anticipating, um, but probably won't take the whole thing away because there are some limits on what we can use it for. Um, we also have to be really careful that we don't just say, oh, we're gonna take the $3 million and, and lay it against the deficit and not be thinking down the road of what happens when the federal money is gone in a couple of years. Have we created a structural deficit that then we're gonna have to deal with? Uh, so we'll be walking through all those discussions, but for purposes of tonight, wanted to show you how far we've come um, just in the month of, of February and, and into March, um, working with the buildings and the departments. Um, I also put the fund balance number in there so you can kind of see um, what we have funds assigned for. 
Uh, so we did anticipate um, in next year's budget, one of the plans was to use, uh, again, a little bit of the PEASERS money and a little bit of the health care money that, that's in those line items. Uh, so you can see what those balances would be. Uh, the unassigned um, needs to be 8% of our expenditures. It is a little high if you do that calculation, but this is just a projection of where we're going to be. So we need to get through this year, uh, kind of see what kind of deficit that we're looking at at the end of this year, and those numbers will all flow through these ones, um, and then we'll have uh, new numbers to share with you again as we, we wrap up the budget process in June. And then the last slide is just the, the cost to the homeowner slide, so you, you have that handy. Any questions on um, proposed budget and where we are? I have just one question to make sure I understand. Sure. Uh, when you talk about revenue changes, is this from what our estimate had been? or? Revenue? So this is for next year's budget, and yes, it's based upon... I'm sorry, say that again. It's for next year's budget, yeah. and it's based upon, yes, where we thought, so we looked at this year's projections yeah. and said, where do we think we're going to be? And then we use those projections to trend for next year. So, so this is the change from the last projection we had. Correct. I just wanted and to make we changed, sure I knew what I was comparing it to. Yep, and we changed, if you look on the spreadsheet, you'll see we changed the projection yeah. for current year and the revenue for next year. Yep, right on. Elizabeth, yes, ma'am. As I read your slide on fund balances and then the uh, summary page, looks like the health care escrow is going to zero out if we put that in. Is that yeah, this is projected for this year. Right. So we will have that fund, those funds used, but we can always, should we choose? So the um, we've been using that money against the uh, HSA that we match, that we make into the employees, to match the employees' contributions into the HSA funds. Um, because we started a new contract where we're continuing that match going forward, should we have some funds at the end of the year that we need to pull out of that unassigned fund balance to get that number down, one of the options that we would have would be to reassign some more funds to that HSA account to cover that for the out years. But you're correct in that we are, we have been planning to draw it down, draw it down, draw it down, um, not anticipating originally that we would continue it. And then when we did the new contract, we just haven't funded it again since then, if okay. that makes sense. Okay. Thank you. I'm sorry, I think this goes under, I think these things would come under building budget. But last year, we were given a list of what programs were in and what were out. Will we be seeing that list again? I will give that list to you when we get to May. Um, okay. The reason I didn't do it for tonight is because one of them is, Ken and Ken's list was so small. Yeah. I mean, it's basically the roof, it, roof and drive it repairs and then the bottle filler stations. And Joshua's list, frankly, was very small as well. Um, so everything that they put in is in at this point. Okay. But yes, I can, I can probably fit it all in one slide this year. So, and Mrs. Rogers, we will sit down and go through this in some more detail. I know this is like wow, <laughs> so promise you we will do that. All right. Any other questions? Keep going. Okay. All right. I'll turn you over to Sarah. You first, or I'm, I'm going to do the introduction. Excuse me. I'm going to do. <laughs> I'm going to do the introduction. Okay. I'm the MC. <laughs> <laughs> so good evening, uh, board and TV community. My name is Sarah Schaefer, and I am the administrator for People Services. A portion of People Services also includes special education, which is brings us to the purpose of what our presentation is about tonight. So tonight, Adele comes there. Uh, she's our director of finance. She will be doing a big picture overview of some of the considerations that go into the special education budgeting. And later I will come back on the start, we'll do one slide, but I'll come back and I'm gonna do a, a, a revisit to our vision for special education. So there, there is a PowerPoint called special education. Okay, good. You can go to the first slide. 
before. The next one. Okay, so you're going to have to look at this kind of on your own. It's very hard to see from this direction. So I have my, my copy too to look at. But what, what I thought we could start with was a, a, a document that kind of gives you an overview, a summary of, of where our special education students are. This report is known as Penn Data or Penn Data. Um, if you access that site below, which is at the very bottom of, that, of the slide, you can actually get data that goes all the way back to 2007, if you're interested in knowing what that looks like. And I'll give you a comparison then. You don't need to write it down, but it can give you a comparison of the data, like how many students had an intellectual disability between now and go back to 2007 and see what that looks like. So what I would like to draw your attention to first is the top block on the left-hand side, which is called enrollment. And it gives you a percent of how many students in special education are in our school district. So right now, we are the LEA, Local Education Agency. That's what CV is. And it gives you the state column on the right-hand side. Does everyone see that? Okay. So it gives our total enrollment, and then it gives our total number of special education. So right now, we have 657 students. And I will say right now means December 1st. Okay, the data is ongoing, but you submit it two times a year. So this was a snapshot on one day. 657 students, which made up 15.8% of our total population of students at CV. And then it gives a breakdown of the students that are in special education, what their disability identification is called. So um, for instance, autism. Of our students that are identified and need an IEP, 18.6% of them are identified with autism and so on for emotional disturbance and multiple disabilities, another health impairment. And what it does on the right-hand side is it gives a comparison to what the state average is then, okay? And so I wanted to draw your attention to the autism category. In our district, we currently have 18.6% of our students identified with autism. The state average is 11.6. This is unusual for this area of the state. We have a number of um, community agencies and behavioral supports um, that are located in just this geographic region that are able to do really good assessments for autism. And when you have a really good base for identifying for autism out in the community and also in schools, you're able to identify it better. So there's a difference between geographic regions of the state that have a really good assessment process um, and that will lead to typically a higher percentage of students that are identified with that, with that disability. But what that means is we need to look at that a little bit differently in terms of what we're going to provide in our district and what that autism service is going to reflect in, a, in an itinerant model through regular education, but also in a more full-time model, which would be more of a class that was all day long and maybe had specific behavior outcomes that, that went along with it. The second part is the box below. It's race, ethnicity. And you can see what our special education percentage of, of um, identification is right now, and then what percentage of that, that race or ethnicity is in our LEA or a CV. There are areas in here that we are currently going to be going, conducting a, a deeper review into through our equity committee and our, and our goal right now. So there, there are a lot of questions that aren't fully washed out in just this data alone. So what this requires us to do, and it's something that we've, we've begun to undertake, is to completely like, tear apart that data and figure out where that's coming from and then and then have a lot of discussions about that. The third area, which is on the right hand side, which is our educational environments, you can see that we're very close in all of our state comparisons. I wanted to draw your attention though to the SE and other settings. SE is special education and other settings. It's a small portion, but it's typically the most expensive portion. And you can see the state average is 4.9%, and you can see CV is 6.1%. And we talk about how we did not have a strong continuum of services, and I'll talk about that when we talk about our vision, but that is a reflection of us needing to contract out to go into other settings, to do other places, to be able to provide support for our CV students. All right, Adele is up next. Thanks, Sue. And welcome. Good to see you too again. This is really great. It's been a while. Okay, so uh, I'm Adele Hunsinger. I'm the Director of Finance, and I'm just going to spend a couple minutes talking about our special education cost and also our special education subsidy. So in that slide, um, what 
CV has taken many uh, cost savings initiatives over the years. And what this shows you here is that even though our special education costs are continuing to increase, you can see the blue portion of the bars. That's the uh, cost that uh, services that CB provides in-house that we're bringing services back from other uh, uh, IUs or other um, school districts that we've contracted with. So, uh, so we're trying to widen that gap where we're providing those services. Next slide, please. This is, I don't know how well you can see it, probably on your screen you'll be able to see it uh, much better, but this is a cost actually from forecast, or a, a slide from forecast five. And if you look over onto the graphics on the right hand side of the slide, what it's showing you is the average special education cost per student, and then it compares uh, CB's cost against the other costs of, from schools in uh, Lancaster and Lebanon counties. And as you can see, CB comes in at about having one of the fifth highest average special education costs per student. And I always hesitate with slides like this because the special average cost per student for special education really isn't reflective of the true picture of special education. You can have some students that whose costs assigned to them are going to be a lot less, or you might have some students that have uh, uh, more severe needs, and those costs are going to be a lot more expensive. So this is just a good uh, reference point to, uh, to have. But in the graphics over on the left-hand side, then takes our special education costs and uh, looks at it as a percentage of our total operating costs. And here, CB is coming in slightly under the average. Our um, special education costs are about 21.5% of our operating expenses. And comparing that to the other, the average of all the other districts in Lancaster and Lebanon, uh, it's about 22%. So we're slightly under the average. Your next slide. So I always like to uh, provide you with this graphic because what this is showing you is that even though our special education costs continue to increase over the years, our special education subsidy that we get from the state is not increasing in proportion to the increase in the special education costs. Um, special education subsidy is a uh, heart uh, formula. I'm not going to go into it as a very complicated calculation, but school districts will get what we call hold harmless amount. It's the amount that they uh, froze from back several years ago. They said, you are going to get at least that amount. For CB, it's $1,562,000. We're going to receive at least that amount every year. The formula part of it is taking certain uh, cost factors, looking at the number of students that are in certain cost thresholds and running it through a formula. And then that'll drive out additional uh, subsidy. However, one of the key components is the amount of that formula subsidy that the state is going to fund. So if that is not increasing in proportion to the state's increasing in special education costs, that gap is going to continue to widen. So another slide from Forecast 5, and this time I want to look a little more on the left side of this slide. So what this shows us is the total of our special education subsidy as a percentage of our total operating revenue. And CB is, has the third lowest percentage. So that really pushes it out that uh, our subsidy has just been has just not increased and kept it, um, up with it, the increasing of the cost. And we're well below the, the average there. You can see there's a, a vertical line that kind of runs up and down the screen that kind of helps to indicate the average for all of the, the, the districts in our uh, Lancaster and Lebanon counties. And then over on the right-hand side of that uh, is also just taking our um, special education subsidy and dividing it by a number of our special education students to drive out a, an average cost per student, but I really think the um, what really talks is the graphics on the left-hand side that we are so far from the bottom. Okay, I'm going to hand this back over to Sarah. Thank you. Okay, so what are, what are we doing in terms of cost-saving initiatives? And, and we have taken the last two years to really explain what we've done because there's been a number of, of really big uh, transitions that we've made. That, that, that bring those cost saving initiatives to light. Um, so if you go back and think about that Penn data report, some of that data that I showed you with the autism numbers were increasing, and also our other settings um, was also higher than state average. And that's a, that's a, a higher than normal cost. Um, 
So both of those areas are significant in our decision and how we develop and wanted to develop a vision for our special education programming here at CV because we wanted to increase our options at home. When you increase your op options at home, it actually results in a decrease in cost for our students, for the taxpayers. And that's what we wanted to focus on. So some of the things that we, we began last year and we're, and we're continuing into this year as we transitioned to a new provider for our OT and PT services, we increased our access reimbursement tracking, we built capacity in our emotional support and our transition programming options, we realigned our paraeducator support model, and we're developing our autism support options. So in general, what we're trying to do is we're trying to build capacity, we're trying to maximize opportunities, we're trying to, to, to ultimately bring our students back to CV, which will um, decrease our contracted costs out and also have the students home where they should be. So the next PowerPoint is our vision. Can I ask a question back? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, just very quickly, I know a couple years ago the contracting for assets, the assets program became a complete mess. Is that running more smoothly yes. now? Are it we is. getting our full reimbursement? We're getting our full reimbursement and we've also increased our billing for that. So we are generating more money. Just remember that fiasco. Yes. It's it's good. Yeah. Would you agree, Phyllis? Yes. Okay. So this is a continuation of last year's presentation in which we called it 2020 vision. It was supposed to be tongue in cheek. <laughs> um, so now our tongue in cheek is that we decided to call it 2021 revision because 2020 didn't go over too well, so we want to revise it. Um, so it's called our 2021 revision for special education. So I wanted to start out with our audit that we just uh, completed. Um, every few years, uh, PD does a, an, an audit on our special education practices or procedures, how we're doing in the district. Um, it's, a, it's a long process. For us, it took about seven months, and they look at over 1,800 areas of compliance. And that's not just 1,800 data points, it means they're looking at 1,800 areas. It, and then following that process, then we do a, a four-day in-person audit, which is presentations and interviews and surveys and talking to people on the phone. So some of the things that we've done is they did an educational benefit review, ultimately a special education working for our students. Interviews, file monitoring, they did a facilitated assessment, we did a staffing review, training, policy review, we did surveys with parents, students, and staff, did a procedure review, we did file monitoring, in which we're looking at extended school year, suspension rates, disproportionality, eligibility, and graduation. The next slide, please. So in general, we'll have a we'll have an um, an audit plan from this forthcoming in the next couple of weeks, maybe months, depends on how how um, the state returns our information to us, but I wanted to give you the glows, okay? So what came out of our audit is that we have a great inclusion program. We have great availability of LRE, and LRE is your least restrictive environment. So we have options for students to be educated in regular education, which is a big deal. We have good psych services. We have staff and families that are invested and supportive. We have increased continuum options. We increased our transition programming. And ultimately, when they looked at our procedures and paperwork, we had, a, we had an exceptional level of compliance at 98%. So when they're looking at those 1,800 areas, we were 98% compliant. To give you an example of maybe what, what would not have made us compliant in an area is that we didn't check one box <laughs> on, a, on, a, on, a, on a paper that was possibly 47 pages in length. That's how in detail they go with the procedures and getting compliance for us. So all in all, our teachers and our staff and our related service providers, they do a really, really good job here at CV doing what they're supposed to be doing in terms of the procedures and paperwork. So a big shout out to them for doing, doing an awesome job. So the GROW, which is our continuum, okay? And I've mentioned that a couple of times. So some of you may be asking, what does she mean by keep saying continuum? What is a continuum? Basically, a continuum in special ed talk is your range of services from the most supportive to the least supportive for all areas of disability. So you wanna be able to provide services for all students. It's called FAPE, your free and appropriate education, that all students can be educated appropriately. And you need to have a continuum of services for them to be able to access that. So this is a, a pre-2020 continuum that I have up for you. And on the top part, in the red 
columns. I have listed some of our big, our big support uh, titles, which is learning support, emotional support, life skills, and autism support. And then on the left-hand side, we have what the supports are from the most restrictive at the bottom all the way to the least restrictive at the top. And what you see are a number of blue boxes that are not filled. This was our pre-2020 continuum, and that shows you that we did not have a complete continuum of services for our students. And what that results in is that we needed to contract with other districts. We needed to contract with the IU. We needed to look for services for our students at CV elsewhere. And what that returns to us is ultimately a higher cost, and our students are not at home with us. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to focus on that. So our vision pushed us into the next slide, which is the 2021 continuum. So these are some of the pieces that we started last year and we're gonna be continuing into this year. And you can see all the blue boxes are filled in. So some of the big things that we have done, are we, we developed an intensive learning support program called, titled Foundations. We redeveloped emotional support at the high school with for varying types of uh, needs for students in emotional support. We enhanced our life skills support with the K-12 curriculum. We developed a transition program focusing on real, a cutting edge curriculum called PAYS work-based learning, work experience, job training, and you'll get to hear more about that program, I think next month, next week, next week, you get to hear more about that, so that's exciting. Um, done, done really amazing work in that program. Um, and we've enhanced our behavior support through the addition of a board certified uh, behavior analyst. So some of the things that we're gonna be doing next year is we need to focus on autism. We really need to look at our itinerant autistic support model we need to look at our speech language as it's embedding into our autism support model. We're gonna focus on our autism programming, establishing um, a full-time emotional or autistic support program that looks at verbal behavior classroom programming. And we're gonna have that K to second grade for next year, two classes. Um, and lastly, we're gonna be focusing on curriculum development and programming for our learning support programming. Now this is just, again, we're, we're in year two of making some, some big changes. So, this vision is always, you know, modifying and looking to the future and, and doing what it can to bring our, bring our kids home and do the best for our CB students. So the next, the solution, like I said, was to develop the continuum, maximize the capabilities, build capacity, and the last page is why we do it. And ultimately, we want, we want to offer a bus student education to all the students. We want to enhance our programming. We want to have financial savings and we want to build our opportunities for us and our students and our families. So that's it. Do you have any questions? Back to one of your very early slides in the last one. Yes. The, the numbers you gave for uh, where we stand percentage what I don't have this in the back of my head, but those seem to me to be very similar to what they were last year. I know you can't just look at one year, but a larger one, but it seems that between last year numbers I remember from last year were very similar. Yes. Yeah, so um, when you're looking at our consistency from um, year to year, you may not see the, the changes in terms of the percentages of students, but you know, just for, just for maybe you would ask that question to me. I, I looked at the 2007 information and I put it somewhere and we have had a significant change, um, and I can give that to you back after, so you can see what that looks like. Um, it was basically, we had 11.8% 11, 11 in special education then, and now we have 15, 15 and some percent, which is, I think that's, I think that's good. Um, you need to see an increase in special education because there, there are, we, have, we have modified the way that we have identified for a lot of our students, and autism has changed in how we identify those needs. Um, there's, there's a lot of high-functioning autism that we weren't identifying the same way back in 2007 that we identify now. So that increase is expected, but it's not so high that makes us think that we are over-identifying. So that's, we're right in that sweet spot of, of, of making some real good decisions for identification. So the total number of students or percentage of students, either way you look at it, that we serve with special services, is it simply growing more slowly than I think, or is it just because we're re reclassifying them and it's not really growing terribly fast? It's not growing terribly fast. The cost of services continues to rise. Okay. So okay. it's the cost of services that we contract for 
through other agencies, through other community services, and to other districts. And okay. that's where the cost to special education is. So it's not that we are, um, you know, identifying a, a, a huge amount of students that are causing more cost. It is the, the services themselves that have that, that price tag associated with it, and that, that increases every year exponentially sometimes. Okay. That surprises me a lot. I mean, I know the costs are going up, but we keep hearing that uh, the growth of the number of kids that, that uh, need special services grows. Is that more of an identification growth that we're not subject to because we've been identifying them so well all along, or are we running contrary to what maybe a lot of the country is? I think different parts of the state are in different levels of identification. Um, if you end up going into that Penn Data report, you can actually access the state report and look at the differences between IUs and how they identify students. And in this geographic region and how we identify autism, it is very different than the, the, the identification of, in autism in other regions of the, of the state of Pennsylvania. So I think there may be some, some differences in how that is kind of coming along. So you may hear from some side of the state saying, you know, we're seeing that increase. I think we saw that increase in, in identification probably about 10 years ago. And now it is kind of leveled out. We saw a, a really big increase in how we were identifying for some things. Yeah, I would probably say about eight to 10 years ago. Then would it be fair to say that uh, allowing that there would be good identification, that the need isn't growing as far as number of kids so much as it is cost of those services, how well we provide them, and if we are someplace it's identifying well. Because they yes. keep trying to, you hear so much about the number of students, you know, in the future that are going to need services, but I, I don't know if that means there's a change in the problem or we're just dealing with it better. I think there is, like I said, there's a change in the, you know, the cost of the services. And in some cases, I would say that the intensity of some um, IEPs that we that we uh, program for yeah. have a higher um, amount of cost than they yeah. may have had. It's often hard to get a grasp on just whether or not this is a problem, uh, a health problem, or if it's just a matter of how we're dealing with it. We see it differently. I, I don't see it specifically at CV as an identification problem. I see it as a as a as a co programming cost. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm not done. Oh, go okay. ahead. You go. Don't go, go ahead. Away. <laughs> Can you remind me? And I, I could have looked back, and I did not. Um, what the predicted cost savings is over the next couple of years for opening up those verbal behavior classrooms. Do you know that off the top of your head? Somebody will. Somebody's. 440,000, 460,000. Yeah. Okay, that's like, that's significant. So I really think that that's important that that part of the vision that you're pursuing mm -hmm. is. Yes, thank you. My turn? Mm -hmm. <laughs> First, I want to say thank you, because I think in this space I don't, I don't do that enough. I would say before you came here, this program was on its way to be a train wreck, in my personal opinion. Um, and, and I think you've really have brought it to a, a level that I wasn't expecting. And I was one of the board members who was ready to outsource it all, done with it. It just wasn't, it just wasn't working. And I think that bringing in the right people for, for this piece of it, uh, the care that you have for this and the vision you have for this has made me into a believer in, into this into this program, and I don't say and I don't say that lightly, etc. The only thing I, I just offer is that as we bring these programs back, it we have to just bring in the right people to, to manage it. If we think our, our principals and other teachers are going to be able to manage some of these these students, it, it's just not going to happen because I I've seen it not work, etc. So. Not giving you an open checkbook, but whatever you need to make this work as we bring it back with the savings, et cetera, I would fully support it. Thank you. Yes, it's 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 vitally important that we do get the right people and we do program 
effectively for students. So we're not doing anything that um, any other district or any other contracted services is providing. We're, you know, our, our program is going to look very, very similar to how, what works in, in programming for students. What, what I like about your, your process and, and your vision is not of, we'll be better next year, which is what we got for years. It's gonna be okay next year. And I just got so tired of hearing it that I really like where you're going. And I think it's fantastic. Thank you. It takes a huge team, so a lot of people out there that well, it that takes a good leader to, to be able to. I, I get that, but it takes someone to lead them to to where they need to be. Thank you. I'll, I'll take that. Should we leave that as thank you <laughs> and pass it on to <laughs> Chris? The downside of that is that oftentimes, and, and we've had this in the past uh, when programs were different. Uh, the better a program you offer, the more people you attract to come here. Want to come in to the, I, I get it. Yeah, so true. Parents with, with children with special needs, uh, I have found, are very sensitive to where their children are, are placed, and they know where the best programs are. So be prepared. We're going to do our best <laughs> to make it into a, a great program here at TV. We good? Thank you very much, Sarah. For Thank you. Please attention in all you do. Thank you. And next is. Yep, I've got the last one. It's the IU budget for next year. And I'm going to pull up uh, for your attachments there. It says uh, IU 21 22 budget highlights. Um, you're more than welcome to open up all the other documents, but this is a very small <laughs> percentage of the overall budget. The overall IU budget is $185 million. And this is about a little over three million dollars. Um, the majority of the costs are not included in here because it's on a student by student basis. Mm -hmm. So that's the fluctuation that is not in the budget part. This is simply the general operating and, and the um, core program services and the instructional media services. Um, there is no increase to the district in those two areas. So that. Kudos to, to uh, Dr. Barnhart and his staff for keeping the cost, the ancillary cost to the districts across the IU um, at a zero increase right now. Um, they're going to take care of that internally, the 1.18, which is about a $22,000 increase, and the 1.23 is about a $15,000 increase for them. So that is uh, what we'll be voting on next week. It will be a roll call vote. If you have any questions after you look at some of those documents, please let me know. But if not, I don't know if you have anything else to add for that. No, I, um, I appreciate you you're posting all of these documents. I never posted all of them because we tend to get lost in them. Basically, for whatever reason, the state requires the local districts just to approve these two parts of the budget. Yeah. And uh, But I, I will um, echo uh, my congratulations to... Uh, the entire uh, management and business department over at the IU. Uh, if you saw the numbers of the services that they offer has grown while they've kept their budget under control. <coughs> they do an excellent job. Uh, and they often have, uh, as we saw before, the most expensive services. And I do know they support completely always having the student back at their home district. Uh, I know there's been some concern on this board about whether or not why use the IU because they're more expensive. Uh, but it is their, um, it, it's their focus and their aim not to have the kids in their programs, to have them back home uh, where they're most comfortable. And uh, I, I think being able to work with them has been, uh, it has worked well for us. Well said. Thank you. And now we're back to Phyllis. I warned you I'd be back. Is this the budget one? The budget update? Yeah, I brought it to UGI. UGI, got it. Um, before we do UGI, so the answer to the question is $430,000, because Adele looked it up while we were sitting back there, so we were, we were close. Um, and just um, for the special ed piece, sorry. Um, 
since Sarah sort of brought it up, I mean, um, to answer Mr. Talley's question, yeah, I mean, Sarah has been a great addition uh, to our team. Um, the thing I most appreciate is when we need to do something, she's looking not just at the problem before us, but okay, what's a different way to maybe do some other things to make this all work? Um, so we've done a lot of, at the cabinet level, deconstruction and reconstruction of things um, over the past two years. And um, I, I think it's, you know, when you peel the pieces apart and you got to put it back together, um, we've gotten some better products out of it. So it's been, been a welcome um, effort, I think, on our part. So good, good stuff there. All right. Um, some really boring procedural things. I apologize, but bear with me and, and we'll get through these next couple of items. Uh, so um, all of my uh, middle school project partners left me here, but um, the one thing, the other thing that we needed to discuss tonight related to the middle school, um, it not related to the right of way with the traffic is the right of way for the natural gas line coming in. Um, and this one's been a, a little bit frustrating. Um, we've been back and forth with the UGI and I'm learning a lesson in the big bad utility tells you what to do and you nod your head and go, okay, I guess that's what we have to do. Uh, so you have um, the right of way and then the settlement for the right of way in front of you. Um, I did have um, Mr. Frank Hauser uh, review both of these. Uh, two questions that we had um, related to this. One was um, when UGI, when we originally met with UGI, they gave us a path uh, for the gas line. And um, so this goes back months and months ago. Um, we had that all programmed and put in, in place uh, with Horst and the contractors. Um, in the middle of it, we got a new relationship manager at UGI and now have a different path for the natural gas line. Uh, so we had to go back um, and figure out, uh, actually added 400 feet, um, which obviously adds additional cost. Um, the good news is it's only about $15,000 um, of cost uh, to um, run the line where they're now saying is the language is the safest and best place for it. Um, I ask the um, silly question, which is, do we have to do <laughs> put it where you tell us to put it? Um, and the answer was yes, um, just because I'm curious as to why the first one wasn't the best and safest place. So, anywho, um, we um, have agreement now on the path of the line. Um, and there's a bunch of parameters about things you can't build over the line and access to the line and all of that's um, in the right of way agreement. Uh, the other piece that we will eventually bring back to you that is not necessarily related to the right of way um, is related to the cost uh, to put the gas line in. And so it's not just the cost for us, but when UGI does this, they look at sort of all the upstream and downstream um, volume to be able to make sure everything works for everybody across that line. And we have been told that there will be a one-time contribution that will be need to, need to be made to UGI um, for the benefit of us um, getting the natural gas service that we are going to require. Uh, so we're, we're pushing hard on that one as well, um, because we would like to see that cost be as low as possible. Um, I, the last conversation we had with them essentially resulted in um, PUC, <coughs> cut and paste of PUC language coming back to us that says this is where it says we can do this. Um, so, okay, so we, we understand why it's there, but the dollar amount is not in the PS, PUC language, so we're going to try to get the dollar amount to be as low as possible. Um, so that's not related to this, but just so you know that that's out there and transpiring and we're, we're working hard at it. Um, but the right of way will be then on consent for next week. Um, Mr. Frank Hauser has blessed it. And so I, I think we're, we'll get rid of that. Any questions on the right of way? I don't have a question, but I can, I can explain why the uh, safest right of way changed. Okay. Uh, by law, they have a procedure they must follow, and they must have your agreement and present this to you uh, at the front end. Then it goes to several other agencies who decide if they think it's the best place to have it, and it comes back and goes through the whole thing again. It goes through the state and federal and a couple of other who knows what. But th that's why it changes. Well, then it may change again because yes. we haven't gone through all of that because obviously we don't have the right of way document yet. What changed for us was the 
person that we were talking yeah, to. Yeah, but so. they, uh, they have to go through. Yep, that is true. That yep, you're absolutely. not even involved in it. And then they come back and say, by the way, what we told you we wanted isn't what we wanted. Of course, they won't let us do it that way. Correct, yes. And it goes on forever. So stay tuned. <laughs> All right, uh, next item on the agenda. This should be an easy one. Um, obviously, with uh, when we push the bid back on the middle school and then push the project schedule back, um, that means that the modulars that are currently at Brownstown housing the sixth grade need to stay um, for, I think it's nine or 10 additional months. And um, they have graciously just said, we'll, we'll do it at the same cost. That, I mean, costs everywhere are going up, right? But um, they're going to just maintain it at the same cost that we did the original contract at. So that's that line item. Uh, next yeah, item on the agenda is the S. Week. Oh, I'm sorry. Talk about the Brown How are we doing on Brownstown? Punch list, everything going okay? Nothing so um, we are down to the final pieces. Um, in order to push the punch list along, uh, we actually, um, and this was. I'll give Don Main credit for this idea. Um, we were, I was a little frustrated one day. <laughs> um, you and I have talked about getting the punch list completed. And um, we found uh, through Don a third party that came in and itemized and priced all of the items that remain on the punch list. And so um, at, as we get that documentation back from them, that will be the the leverage that we have to say, well, you can either do the work or this company will bring somebody in to do this work and this is the cost and we'll be paying them instead of you. Okay. Um, so we're really down to the general contractor um, and, and it's a much shorter list. Um, it, it has been moving. I will be honest with you, it has been moving. Um, and there are two pieces that we know that are going to have to wait until school is, well, one is gonna have to wait until you know the weather looks like it's been looking. Um, which is making sure some of the seating um, and grading and everything happens on the site outside. Um, and then the other piece that we are intentionally waiting until the kids are out of the building uh, for the summer is um, we want them to come in and do some work on the flooring. And so that's obviously not going to happen while we have traffic in the building. Outside of those two pieces, we're anticipating um, everything else you know, should be wrapped up shortly. And if it's not, that's what we'll do is we'll have that other company come in and flush it out. And I know we don't do a lot of construction projects at this size. So the first one's always painful. It'd be great to see a lessons learned. Yeah, we have actually been having, um, so we identified, uh, and we, sh we will have a overall lessons learned meeting, um, but we have identified a couple of areas that are, have sort of been sore spots. And um, we have been having individual debrief meetings on, on with those vendors related to those, they seem to be grouped, <laughs> um, either into specific areas or specific contractors. And so we've been working through those. Um, we've had two already, and we have another one that we're, we're scheduling. Um, so th that's the biggest piece, and we're trying to catch that and do that first, because some of those same products and services are going to be in the middle school. And so we wanna make sure that we catch it before we get too far with the middle school Obviously, we don't want to repeat those sure. sorts of things. So, and, and we decided on the next next school remodel. Who is it going to be? So, the future project meetings that we've started will be looking in on a parallel track at the existing middle school as well as Leola. At the same time. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, SOS contract extension. So, I, we've said this, um, I believe, to the board before that. Um, we are in the third year of our contract with SOS. Um, remember, that was one uh, because we have to follow the uniform grant guidelines with the state for it because of the federal funds that we use um, related to both um, federal funded paras as well as food service, um, that we have to go through a process with the state of, that the state requires for this one. So um, I was not, to be perfectly honest, um, clear that we could just choose to extend it even though the RFP allowed for two one-year extensions. We contacted the state. They said, yes, we are allowed because it was in the original RFP. That way we are allowed to do it. 
we can't do a two-year extension though. We have to do a one-year, and then if we choose a year from now to extend it for the final year, we can do this process again. Um, so uh, had um, Mr. Frankhauser draft the simple addendum that you have before you, um, shared it with SOS. Um, they verified and came back that um, they're agreeable to it. The one change that they are going to make behind the scenes, and we've, Dr. Z and I have been talking to them about this, I think at our last two quarterly meetings, um, is looking at some of the pay rate, a pay rate adjustment for um, some of the positions. Um, and with the pandemic and the job market the way it is, I mean, you would actually think that it would be easier to fill positions. Um, in, in some areas, we're, we are full, we're filled, um, but in other areas, we're not. Um, across the IU, we actually look pretty good, but we have, they have had a hard time with recruiting. So they're seeing it on the grassroots level that they don't have the interest in the positions um, that they've had in past years. Uh, so we're going to definitely take a look at that. Um, they believe, and what they've committed, is that they're going to be able to do that within the same um, markups that the current uh, contract is under. So they are not going to increase anything. Um, they're just going to fit it in and, um, you know, we'll, we'll make that adjustment and hopefully, um, you know, recruiting will pick up and, and we'll be full or close to full for next year. Questions on that one? So this is the same, our subs will be making the same thing in the coming year? Well, we do. We do an increase, you, we usually do the same increase for um, contracted staff that we do for our own support staff. What we have in the budget right now is two and a half percent. Okay. So, they, so will they will get an increase, but some will get more of an increase than others because they're going to change some of the rates. I get it. Okay, I is the STS contract. So this is our teacher substitute contract. Uh, and this one is up, so it's not an extension. It is a renewal. Um, some contract language changes, not a lot from the last one, but a couple really just kind of getting towards uh, some COVID related items um, in, in this. There is one addition that you may see a difference and, and I'll try to highlight it um, if it gets changed between this week and next. Um, is we did uh, trip over a couple of times um, making sure that a substitute who's fit, who ends up filling a long-term assignment has the proper emergency cert. And we got it taken care of, but there seemed to be confusion about who needed to make sure all of that happened and they need to do it, not us. Um, so we are asking for, I mean, literally like a half a sentence in the agreement that just clarifies that. Um, that's the only thing that you should see different in this one between uh, this week and next week. Uh, but other than that, um, the STS contract and the rates that are at the end, um, so the markup did change by one percentage point, but all of the other rates that are listed come right out of our bargaining unit contract. So they're, they're not something that they calculate, it's calculated off what we negotiated in the bargaining, in the last bargaining unit agreement. Any questions on STS? Okay. Oh, one more. Okay, forecast five. So um, as you listen to the special ed presentation, um, you saw a couple more forecast five charts. Um, and that one, um, this is a service um, that we use. Um, you've seen charts from it before from both Adele and I. Um, and uh, now we are actually also diving into the student side to use for some of the, um, the equity research we're doing. So there's two pieces to it. There's five site and five cast. Five site um, enables us to do a lot of comparisons across us and peer groups within the IU. Uh, five cast allows us to do projections and take um, trends and kind of say, what are they going to look like going forward? We, we, when we originally went into this agreement, um, we had both. Uh, we backed away from it due to cost and are now finding that we are missing this five cast piece. Um, we are actually hoping to go ahead and um, have you sign off on this tonight because we uh, would like to go ahead and purchase it this year. Um, we did have um, a piece of money in the business office budget that was set aside um, for 
uh, some work that we were going to do with a, um, a review of one of our areas that we're not going to do. So we would like to use that money instead for this, and it will enable us, we believe, uh, with all the ESSER funds and the three different pots, um, not only for tracking purposes on our side, but to be able to show you all um, some different scenarios of what the budget could look like. And so hopefully it will help all of us in our planning going forward. So it is the one uh, action item that we're asking you to take action on tonight instead of waiting for next week, um, because um, I, I've been begging Adele to get all the reports ready um, that we need to send to them to get loaded. And they just need a little bit of time to get them loaded and get the scenarios built uh, in time for our retreat at the end of the month. Is there a motion to approve the forecast by agreement? So moved. Second. Okay, we have to roll call this, right? Because it's money. Okay, Keisha? Aye. 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 And aye. Motion's approved. Thank you very much. I think that's it for me. All right. Dr. Mann. Okay, one other item. We'd like to recommend a change to the calendar that you approved back in February. One of the things I didn't realize when we built this calendar was that we had already reserved the venue at Calvary Church for next year, mm -hmm. which was June 3rd or August 31st. Um, more and more districts are starting to use that venue. And so by doing that, our original end date was June 2nd. We talked with the local district and see if, if there was any movement in there. There was not with them. So what I'm recommending is that we add in April 14th, Holy Thursday, as a day off. That pushes us to June 3rd, so that the last day of school is the day of graduation. Does that matter? Graduation is a day later. It, it wouldn't matter. Um, this 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 would be actually making graduation the same day last day. So all the kids will go an extra day day later. No, no. We're gonna have off school April 14th. Yeah. Which then pushes the last day to June 3rd. That's when the last day of school will be a day later than what it was going to be. Correct. So the kids can graduate on the last day of school. Correct. Yes. That Does me, it matter? That for me I just as well feel they go, they go till Friday now instead of till Thursday. Right. Does it matter? They're built till Friday this yeah. year as well. I shifted a whole scamp calendar on what grade. It, it increases the spring break by an extra day. Yeah. Okay. And this year's spring break was non existent. Yeah. Is there a reason why the 14th of April cannot be a makeup day? One of the things that the calendar committee from putting this together this year was to, to indicate not to touch the, the Easter break. However, that was under the impression that the 14th wasn't there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that definitely could be added. And still, it still uh, preserves that the intent. Right, the Friday, Monday is still there. Right. Yeah. So this will be on consent. Thank you. Consent. And the last one, um, as you know, normally during the superintendent's report, we approve Act 86 substitute teachers. Those are student teachers that are allowed to substitute for us uh, on a limited basis. And we would like that approved this week so we can get them working tomorrow. Wednesday and Thursday and Friday, <laughs> next Monday and Tuesday, Wednesday. We'll keep them gainfully employed. Um, substitute teachers are, are tough to come by, and uh, these young men and women are, are very enthusiastic to get into the classroom when they pay for it. Do you want a, uh, a motion? We do, please. We would like a motion today, please. All right. Motion that we approve the substitute teacher listing. Second. And we need a roll call. Yes, okay. Aye. 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 Okay. Uh, you see the tentative board agenda for next week. And the one we 
um, time for public comments. Any more public still here? Comments? Hearing none. Any more board comments? Okay. And we need a motion to adjourn to executive session. Yes, ma'am. I move that we adjourn to executive session. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 We are adjourned.